This chapter on components contains information you need to know to effectively sell, troubleshoot, and repair Caterpillar hydraulic components or systems. You'll be able to identify hydraulic fluid reservoirs, discuss their location, design, function, and application, and apply basic troubleshooting strategies. Objective. Given a basic hydraulics diagram, you'll be able to identify tank components and state their function. In this lesson, you'll learn about the types of tank assemblies used in Caterpillar hydraulic systems and the components that are usually included in these assemblies. The main purpose of hydraulic tanks is to ensure that the hydraulic system always has an ample supply of oil. Tanks also serve other purposes. Tank walls dissipate the heat that builds up in hydraulic oil, and tank baffles help separate air and condensation from the oil. In addition, some contaminants settle to the bottom of the tank where they can be removed. There are two types of tanks used in mobile hydraulic systems, vented and pressurized. The vented tank breathes, allowing for pressure compensation under changing oil levels and temperatures. Pressurized tanks are sealed from the atmosphere, keeping dirt and humidity out of the tank. The internal pressure also forces oil towards the pump, avoiding pump cavitation. Some pressurized tanks have external air pumps that pressurize the tank. Others use the pressure that is naturally generated as the hydraulic fluid heats up. This is an example of a vented tank. This photograph shows the vented tank used on a Caterpillar off-highway truck. Here you can see a pressurized tank from a backhoe loader. Caterpillar pavement profilers are equipped with pressurized tanks like the one shown here. Excavators also use pressurized tanks. In this lesson, you'll learn the functions and locations of the components on a hydraulic tank assembly, including the following. A. Fill tube assembly. B. Internal filters. C. Sight gauge. D. Return line. E. Drain plug. F. Pump outlet. G. Baffle plate. H. Breaker relief valve. I. Breather. The fill tube is the entry point for adding oil. The cap keeps contaminants from entering the tank through the fill tube. The screen strains contaminants out of the oil as the oil enters the fill tube. Many tank assemblies include internal filters which clean the return oil. The sight gauge allows visual inspection of the current oil level in the tank as well as maximum and minimum oil levels. The return line returns oil to the tank from the system. The drain plug may be removed to drain the tank. The pump outlet is an oil flow passage from the tank to the pump. Baffle plates separate the suction and return areas of the tank and direct the flow of oil in the tank. Baffles increase the time the oil is in the tank, allowing contaminants to settle, water to evaporate, and air to separate from the oil. In addition, baffles reduce oil splashing inside the tank due to vehicle movement. The return baffle keeps return oil from agitating oil in the tank. A breaker relief valve is used on pressurized tanks. As hydraulic oil warms, pressure increases and the valve opens, preventing excessive pressure from rupturing the tank. As the air cools and pressure drops, the valve opens to prevent the resulting vacuum from collapsing the tank. The breather allows air in and out of vented tanks. It includes a filter to keep dirt out and is located above the oil level in the tank. Objective. You'll be able to describe the three basic types of hydraulic accumulators and how they work. Accumulators are containers that store hydraulic oil under pressure. They're used in a variety of applications on Caterpillar products. There are three basic types. 1. Weighted, 2. Spring, and 3. Gas charged. The weighted accumulator is the earliest type of accumulator. It consists of a cylinder, piston, packing, seals, and a weight. As system pressure rises, 
Oil fills the cylinder and the piston and weight are pushed up. As system pressure drops, the weight forces the piston down, pushing the oil back into the system. It provides steady pressure, but is too heavy and bulky for mobile systems. The spring accumulator consists of a spring, piston, and cylinder. As system pressure rises, oil fills the cylinder, forcing the piston up and compressing the spring. When system pressure drops, the spring decompresses, forcing oil back into the system. Spring accumulators are seldom used in mobile hydraulic systems. The gas-charged accumulator is the type most commonly used on Caterpillar machines. It consists of a cylinder, piston or bladder, and charging valve. Oil entering the cylinder pushes the piston or bladder up, compressing the gas. As oil pressure drops, the gas expands, pushing the oil out. The gas-charged accumulator is versatile, powerful, and accurate, but it requires careful maintenance. The reservoir of oil and pressure stored by accumulators provides four basic functions on mobile hydraulic systems. One, compensate for variations in flow. Two, maintain constant pressure. Three, absorb shocks. Four, provide emergency pressure and flow. In some systems, demand for flow can occasionally exceed the capabilities of tanks and pumps. In these cases, an accumulator can supply temporary flow requirements. When operation returns to normal, the accumulator refills with oil. Accumulators compensate for variations in system pressure by supplying pressure and absorbing pressure as needed. Sudden load changes can cause pressure surges in the system. The accumulator works as a shock absorber by taking in surging oil and letting it out after the surge. If engine power is lost, the accumulator can supply hydraulic flow and pressure to the system for a limited time. This is often used to supply emergency oil to brakes and steering. In this lesson, you'll discover why accumulators are used on some mobile hydraulic systems. The accumulator on the 446 backhoe loader improves machine efficiency, permits use of a smaller pump, and provides emergency braking capability. The steering circuits of G-Series motor graders are equipped with accumulators. This improves steering performance by compensating for variations in system flow and pressure. The accumulator also provides emergency steering capability if engine power is lost. Accumulators are used in the cushion hitch circuit of this 637E wheel tractor scraper. They improve the rotability of the machine by damping oscillations between the tractor and the scraper. Objective. You'll be able to apply general troubleshooting strategies for hydraulic tanks and accumulators. This lesson covers general troubleshooting strategies for hydraulic tanks and accumulators. Hydraulic tank failure is rare and typically involves some type of externally caused damage. Repair options are generally obvious and straightforward. Accumulators, however, can require careful, periodic maintenance to ensure proper operation. There are several ways accumulators can fail. The most common failures include internal or external gas or oil leak, bladder rupture, external damage, broken or weak springs. The most common causes for accumulator failure include improper installation, over or under charging, piston seal failure, charging valve failure, and bladder cracking or fatigue. Tank or accumulator failure is often indicated by slow or erratic implement response, visible leaks, failure to absorb shocks, and poor ride. When failure occurs, you have three options for repair. You can replace component parts such as valves, bladder, springs, piston, or seals, recharge the gas, or replace the accumulator. Upon completing this topic, you'll be able to identify hydraulic fluid conditioners, discuss their location, design, function, and application, 
and apply basic troubleshooting strategies. Objective. You'll understand the location, design, function, and application of hydraulic fluid filters and filter bypass valves. In this lesson, you'll learn about hydraulic fluid filters, including the design, function, application, and location of filters and filter bypass valves. Filters keep hydraulic oil clean by removing contaminants that can damage component parts. As oil passes through the filter element, contaminants are trapped. Clean oil continues through the system. The element, or mesh, is given a micron rating according to its ability to trap particles. The smaller the micron rating, the smaller the particle that will be trapped. There are two basic types of oil filters. One, surface, and two, depth type. As the name implies, surface filters trap contaminants on the surface of the filter element or mesh. Depth type filters trap contaminants of different sizes at different levels with the element. Oil filters may be classified as one of these three designs. Cartridge filter, filter element fits into housing. Canister filter, one piece filter and housing, similar to an automobile oil filter. Screen, metallic mesh that traps large oil contaminants before they enter the system. A hydraulic system may require several filters, each with its own purpose and location. A pressurized filter protects valves and actuators from fine contaminant particles and may be either a surface type or a depth type cartridge filter. A suction filter protects pumps and other components from coarse contaminants. There is very little pressure drop across this filter to prevent pump cavitation. Suction filters are usually surface filters. A pump or motor case drain filter removes debris caused by pump or motor wear or failure. It's a low volume, low pressure filter and can be a cartridge or canister filter. A return filter removes contaminants that enter the system during operation, keeping them from entering the tank. It's usually a surface filter. Most cartridge and canister filters are equipped with filter bypass valves to ensure that system flow is never blocked. Two conditions could cause such blockage. One, a buildup of contaminants may clog the filter. Two, cold oil may be too thick to pass through the filter. Either condition could affect system performance or cause component damage. The bypass valve is usually a spring-loaded poppet. As flow through the filter decreases due to clogging or thick, cold oil, pressure increases on the intake side. When the pressure difference reaches a predetermined limit, called the cracking pressure, the poppet opens, allowing oil to bypass the element. The bypassed oil is unfiltered, so the filter must be serviced as soon as possible. In the case of cold oil, the bypass valve will close as soon as the oil heats up. Objective you'll be able to apply troubleshooting strategies and service options for filters. Oil filters are maintenance items designed to be periodically serviced or replaced. This lesson discusses filter service requirements and the effects of neglecting this important maintenance. In each of these conditions, contaminated oil will bypass the filter. Filters clog, filters collapse, improper filter seating. These are the most common causes of filter failure. Ignoring filter service intervals, external damage, improper installation, unusual contaminants, component failure. Filter failure is often indicated by dirty oil, accelerated wear on valve components, noisy pump, bypass valve alarm. To service filters you should Follow service interval recommendations for your vehicle. Always use correct Caterpillar filters. Drain contaminated oil and replace with clean oil and filters. Objective. You'll learn how hydraulic oil coolers work and why they're used in some mobile hydraulic systems.
In this lesson, you'll discover how hydraulic oil coolers work and why they're used in some mobile hydraulic systems. As components work in high-pressure hydraulic systems, heat builds up in the oil. If temperatures rise too high, it can result in damaged components. Oil coolers are heat exchangers, similar to car radiators, that use air or water to maintain safe operating temperatures. Two types of coolers are used on Caterpillar machines, air to oil and water to oil. This is an air to oil cooler. It works when oil passes through a tube covered with cooling fins. A fan blows air over the tube and fins, cooling the oil. This is an example of an air to oil cooler on a backhoe loader. Here you see a water to oil cooler. With this variety, oil passes through a series of tubes that are cooled by water. This is an example of a water to oil cooler on a D9N. Objective. You'll be able to apply troubleshooting strategies and service options for oil coolers. Oil coolers must be kept in good working condition since overheating can severely damage many hydraulic components. This lesson describes the failure modes and repair options for coolers. Coolers can fail due to internal clogging, external clogging of fins, air to oil, tube and fin fatigue from vibration, crimped, broken, or punctured tubes. Cooler failure is usually caused by one of two conditions, improper maintenance, external damage. Any of the following conditions may indicate cooler failure. Leaking oil, abnormally high oil temperature, sticky, varnish-coated valve spools due to overheating, abnormal temperature differential between cooler inlet and outlet. When cooler failure occurs, you have only two repair options. Clean fins, replace. Do not attempt to clean tubes on water to oil cooler. Upon completing this topic, you'll be able to identify hydraulic pumps and motors, discuss their location, design, function, and application, and apply basic troubleshooting strategies. In this topic, you'll learn about hydraulic pumps and motors. The lessons on gear, vane, and piston pumps will show you the components that make up each type of pump, how they work, and where they're used on various CAT machines. The lesson on motors compares the similarities and differences between pumps and motors. The lesson on troubleshooting describes common pump and motor problems and service requirements. Objective you'll be able to define terms used to discuss various types of hydraulic pumps. Hydraulic pumps convert mechanical energy into hydraulic energy in the form of fluid flow. When the hydraulic fluid encounters some resistance to its flow, pressure is created. Although pumps don't directly generate hydraulic pressure, they must be designed to withstand the pressure requirements of the system. Generally, the higher the operating pressure rating, the tougher the pump. These are some terms frequently used to discuss various types of hydraulic pumps. Positive displacement refers to pumps that always generate flow when operating. Most of the pumps used on CAT machines are this type. Fixed displacement pumps are those that move a constant or fixed volume of fluid for each pump revolution. Variable displacement pumps can adjust the volume of fluid pumped during each revolution. Pressure compensated pumps are variable displacement pumps equipped with a control device that adjusts pump output in order to maintain a desired system pressure. Bidirectional pumps are reversible and can be driven in either direction. There are three ways a hydraulic pump can be considered to be pressure compensated. One, a pump that is equipped with a pressure compensation valve to limit maximum system pressure. Two, a pump that varies output flow to maintain a specified pressure differential. Servo valves or margin spools are generally used to signal the pump. Three, a pump that maintains a specified flow rate even if load pressures increase. This is typical of Caterpillar backhoe loaders.
Pump displacement is calculated by measuring the volume of fluid moved during a specified time, usually one complete revolution of the pump. At Caterpillar, pump displacement is expressed in gallons or liters per minute. Objective. You'll be able to identify hydraulic gear pumps and discuss their location, design, and application. Gear pumps are fixed, positive displacement pumps. Their simple, rugged design makes them useful in a wide variety of applications. Many Caterpillar machines use gear pumps. A drive shaft turns the drive gear, which forces the idler gear to turn. A seal is formed by the gear teeth against the housing and the gears as they turn. Oil enters the inlet port, is trapped between the teeth and the housing, and is carried around and forced through the outlet port. This is a disassembled gear pump. The components of this gear pump are identified on this illustration as follows. Number one shows the seals. Two, the pressure plate. Three, the idler gear. Four, the drive gear. And five, the housing. The hydraulic pump on this D7H track type tractor supplies the main hydraulic implement circuit. This 773 off-highway truck uses a gear pump to power the hoist cylinders. The 216 skid steer loader has a two-section gear pump that provides flow to the main implement circuits. Objective. You'll be able to identify hydraulic vein pumps and discuss their location, design, and application. Vein pumps are fixed, positive displacement pumps. These smooth-running, long-lasting pumps are frequently used on Caterpillar machines. A drive shaft turns the rotor. Oil enters the chamber created between two veins and the housing and is carried to the outlet port. The vein pump consists of a cam ring, veins, and slotted rotor. Most Caterpillar vein pumps are balanced pumps with two sets of inlet and outlet ports opposite each other. The veins are pushed against the inside surface of the ring by centrifugal force, springs, or high-pressure oil. This permits the veins to self-compensate for wear. This is a disassembled vein pump. The components of this vein pump are identified as follows. A. End housing. B. Flex plate. C. Rotor. D. Cam ring. E. Vein. F. Seal. G. End housing. The D9N track type tractor uses a vein pump to supply main implement power. The RR250 road reclaimer uses two vein pumps, one to supply flow to the steering and brake circuits and one for the implement circuits. Objective. You'll be able to identify hydraulic piston pumps and discuss their location, design, and application. Piston pumps can be variable or fixed displacement depending on their design. These versatile, efficient pumps are frequently used in load sensing, pressure compensated hydraulic systems. As you can see here, a variable displacement piston pump consists of number one, a drive shaft, number two, the cylinder barrel, number three, a port plate, number four, pistons, number five, slippers, number six, a retraction plate, and number seven, the swash plate. The drive shaft is connected to the cylinder barrel. As it turns, the pistons move back and forth in the cylinders because they are connected to the swash plate. As the piston retracts, it pulls oil into the cylinder through the inlet port and then ejects it on the downstroke through the outlet port. The amount of oil pumped depends on the angle of the swash plate. When the swash plate is at a maximum angle, there is maximum flow. At zero angle, there is no displacement and no flow. Piston pumps can also be fixed displacement. This axial piston pump has a swash plate with a fixed angle to the drive shaft. In this design, the drive shaft is attached to the barrel, causing the cylinder barrel to rotate and pistons to move in and out of the barrel as they follow the angle of the swash plate. There are many other designs for both fixed and variable displacement piston pumps. This is a disassembled D8N variable displacement piston pump. 
This is a fixed displacement piston pump. Newer 992 wheel loader models use two fixed displacement piston pumps to supply main implement power. Older models of the 992 use one fixed displacement piston pump and one variable displacement piston pump. The AG65 Challenger uses a variable displacement piston pump to power implements and its three-point hitch. The load sensing pressure compensated system on this machine matches hydraulic power output to implement need, resulting in better fuel economy. Objective. You'll be able to identify hydraulic motors and discuss their location, design, and application. Hydraulic motors are actuators that convert hydraulic energy to mechanical energy in the form of rotary motion and force. They're used on Caterpillar machines to drive tracks, wheels, and implements. Hydraulic motors are nearly identical to hydraulic pumps. This is true of gear, vane, and piston motors. The main difference is that high pressure oil enters the motor, causing the internal components to rotate. The oil then leaves the motor at low pressure and is returned to the tank. When the motor is running in forward, the internal components rotate in this manner. Shifting the control valve to the reverse position, as you can see here, reverses the oil flow, changing the direction of the motor rotation. Most hydrostatic drive systems on Caterpillar machines are closed loop systems. That means that return oil from the motor flows directly back to the pump inlet. A charge pump is used to fill the system at startup and replenish oil that is lost due to system leakage. Hydrostatic drive systems like the one shown here include these components which are indicated as follows. One is the directional control valve. Two, the charge pump. Three, the main pump. Four, the filter. Five, the makeup valve. Six, the charge relief valve. Seven, the crossover relief valve. Eight, the relief valve. 9, the motor, 10, the cooler, and 11, the tank. The E-Series hydraulic excavators use piston motors to drive the swing mechanisms. The D-11N track-type tractor uses a gear-type hydraulic motor to drive the engine radiator fan. The motor is powered by a pressure-compensated axial piston-type hydraulic pump. Objective. You'll know basic service requirements, be able to recognize hydraulic pump and motor failure indicators and their causes, and be able to apply basic troubleshooting strategies. A variety of operating conditions can affect the performance and life of hydraulic pumps. This lesson will teach you more about the performance and service of pumps and motors. Failed pumps and motors result in leakage, wear, broken or failed components. There are four primary causes of pump or motor failure. One, cavitation. Two, aeration. Three, contamination. Four, improper fluid. However, failure can also occur from excessive heat or pressure, normal wear. When a pump and motor receives little or no oil, vapor cavities form and collapse in the pump. This causes implosions that wear away the internal components of the pump or motor. In addition, components are scored because of lack of lubrication. If you see any of the following, you're probably dealing with failure caused by cavitation. Distinctive rattling sound, erratic implement operation, heat buildup at pump, pump paint burns. There are several conditions that can lead to cavitation. The most common causes include restricted inlet line, for example, a plugged filter, excessive speed, low oil level, too high oil viscosity, tank pressurization failure, unauthorized system changes and or substandard parts. Aeration is the entrapment of air into the oil and is caused by air leaks in the system. When air bubbles enter the pump or motor, they burst, causing the internal components to wear away. If you see any of these signs, it's likely that aeration is causing pump or motor failure.
pump or motor noise, erratic implement operation, heat buildup at pump or motor, spongy implement control, foamy oil. Pumps and motors are susceptible to damage caused by dirt, water, and other abrasive contaminants. Causes of contamination include poor maintenance, loose line connections, damaged seals, careless work habits such as leaving the cap off the tank, allowing contaminants into tank when filling with oil, or leaving the vent off the tank. It's important to use oil with the proper fluid viscosity. Here are some problems that may occur if the wrong fluid is used. If the fluid is too thin, it can cause increases in internal and external leakage, pump or motor slippage, excessive component wear from inadequate lubrication, reduction in system pressure, spongy implement control. If the fluid is too thick, it may result in increases in internal friction, temperature increases with resulting sludge buildup, sluggish and erratic operation, more power required for operation. The best indicators of pump or motor failure include noise, both cavitation and aeration will produce a rattling sound, poor machine performance such as reduced capacity, erratic operation, spongy controls, excessive heat, excessive leakage, foamy oil, a variety of repair options are available for pumps and motors depending on the type and whether repair occurs before or after failure. Study this repair options tree for the most common repair options. Refer to the appropriate product support literature for details. Upon completing this topic, you'll be able to identify hydraulic lines and connections, discuss their location, design, function, and application, and apply basic troubleshooting strategies. Objective. You'll be able to identify hydraulic lines and connections, discuss their location, design, function, and application, and apply basic troubleshooting strategies. This lesson discusses the various types of hydraulic lines used on Caterpillar machines. You'll learn how tubes and hoses are constructed and the advantages of each. A tube is a rigid hydraulic line, usually made of steel. Tubes are used to connect components that do not move in relation to each other. Tubes also generally require less space than hoses and can be firmly attached to the machine, resulting in better protection to the lines and a better overall machine appearance. Hydraulic hoses are used whenever flexibility is needed, such as when components move in relation to each other. Hoses absorb vibration and resist pressure variations. Hoses are made of several layers of material. On this illustration, you can clearly identify the different levels. The polymer inner tube is identified as number one. The reinforcement layer is number two. A polymer friction layer, number three. And the outer cover by the number four. The polymer inner tube carries the oil. A reinforcement layer of wire or fiber wrap supports the inner tube. If there's more than one reinforcement layer, a polymer friction layer will separate them. The outer cover protects the hose from wear. CAT equipment uses a variety of low, medium, and high pressure hose, depending on system requirements. The most common are shown here. One is XT3, four spiral, high pressure, 2,500 to 4,000 PSI. Two is XT5. 4, 6 spiral, high pressure, 5,000 PSI. 3 is XT6, 6 spiral, high pressure, 6,000 PSI. 4 is 716, 1 wire braid, medium low pressure, 625 to 2,750 PSI. 5 is 844, hydraulic suction, medium low pressure, 100 to 300 PSI. 6 is 556, one wire braid, fabric covered, medium low pressure, 500 to 3000 psi. 7 is 1130, engine air brake, medium low pressure, 250 to 1500 psi. 8 is 1028, thermoplastic, medium low pressure, 
1,250 to 3,000 PSI. 9 is 294, two-wire braid, medium, low pressure, 2,250 to 5,000 PSI. In this lesson, you'll learn about the different types of connectors, flanges, and couplings used in Caterpillar hydraulic systems. Connections is a term that refers to a variety of couplings, flanges, and connectors used to attach hoses and tubes to hydraulic components. Couplings are those connections used to attach hose to components or other lines. There are three types, crimp-on, screw, and collet. Crimp-on couplings are permanent, low failure rate, works well in all pressure applications. Screw-type couplings are reusable, can be field assembled using hand tools, most effective in lower pressure applications. Collet type couplings are reusable, designed for high pressure Caterpillar XT hose, can be field assembled using a hand press. The CAT collet type is a reusable coupling made up of a stem collet assembly and a steel sleeve. The stem is inserted into the end of the hose with the tapered collet fingers extending down the outside surface. The sleeve is then pressed over the fingers to hold the coupling on the hose. These couplings are usually used with a split flange and an O-ring to couple large, high-pressure hoses. Flanges are used to connect large diameter hoses and tubes to blocks, valve bodies, and other components. Flanges may be brazed directly to a tube or attached to a hose coupling, then bolted to a component. Seal rings, such as O-rings and D-rings, are used to seal a flange and its mating surface. Two types of flanges can be found on Caterpillar machines. SAE 4-bolt flange, two pressure ratings, one code 61 standard, 3,000 to 5,000 PSI, two code 62, 6,000 PSI. JIS split flange, same as SAE, but with metric bolts. Sometimes it may be necessary to measure flanges and their mating parts to ensure correct selection and assembly of components. Using a dial caliper, first measure the porthole diameter. Next, measure the longest bolt hole spacing from center to center. Then measure the flange head diameter. You can use these three dimensions to cross-reference the correct flange. Threaded connectors are often used for both tube and hose connections. Their use is generally restricted to lines one inch in diameter or smaller. Threaded connectors for hydraulic systems are usually made of steel. Caterpillar designs and produces machines throughout the world. Consequently, many types of threaded connectors are used. SAE Straight Thread O-Ring Boss Recommended for optimum leakage control in port connections for medium and high pressure systems. The external has a straight thread and an O-ring. The internal port has a straight thread and chamber for O-ring. JIC 37 degrees. Very common in hydraulic systems. External and internal halves of connections have 37 degree seats. SAE 45 degrees. Used on refrigeration, automotive and truck piping systems. Frequently made of brass. External and internal connectors have 45 degree seats. Seal takes place between external flare and internal cone seat. O-ring face seal. Best leakage control available. External has a straight thread and an O-ring in the face. Internal has a straight thread and a machined flat face. NPSM. Some hydraulic use. Internal half has a straight thread and an inverted 30 degree seat. External half has a straight thread and a 30-degree internal chamfer. Seal takes place by compression of the 30-degree seat on the chamfer. NPTF, widely used. Thread is tapered and seal takes place by deformation of threads. DIN 3901-3902 series. One common external, three different internal halves. External has a straight metric thread, a 24-degree included angle, and a recessed counter bore. 
internal, may have a tube, nut and sleeve, spherical seat fitting, or spherical seat fitting with O-ring. DIN 7631-7647 series, frequently used on hydraulics. External has straight metric thread and a 60 degree recessed cone. Internal has a straight thread and a spherical seat fitting. Millimetric and GAZ series, common external and two different internal. Millimetric series, used in whole metric OD tubing, GAZ series used with fractional number OD tubing. BSP parallel, similar to NPSM external except thread pitches are different in most sizes. The mating internal swivel is a spherical seat fitting which seals on the cone seat of the external. BSP tapered, similar to NPT except thread pitches are different in most sizes. Thread is tapered, bore is usually chamfered and the seal is accomplished by using a sealant. The JIS tapered PT, shown here on the left, is identical to BSP tapered connections. On the right is a JIS parallel PT connector, which is identical to the BSP parallel. To determine the type of connector needed, threads must sometimes be measured. Three tools are necessary, a seat angle gauge, a thread pitch gauge, and an ID or OD caliper. Use the caliper to measure the thread diameter. Measure the outside diameter of the external threads and the inside diameter of the internal threads. Match your measurements with a hose and coupling guide. Use the thread pitch gauge to determine the number of threads per inch or the distance between threads in metric connectors. Match the measurement to the guide. To measure the sealing surface angle, measure the internal connections by inserting the seat angle gauge into the connector. If the center lines of the connector and gauge are parallel, then the angle has been determined. Measure the external connectors by placing the gauge on the sealing surface. If the gauge and angle fit snugly, the angle has been determined. Objective. You'll know basic service requirements, be able to recognize lines and connections failure indicators and their causes, and be able to apply basic troubleshooting strategies. Hydraulic lines and connections may require frequent service, particularly in severe machine applications. This lesson discusses the service, failure, and repair of lines and connections. When tubes or hoses fail, you may see tubes or hoses leak, tubes or hoses split or burst, welds and connections break, connections leak. Line failure can be caused by abrasion, external damage, excessive temperature, excessive pressure, fatigue, age, improper routing, or using the improper line for a given application. Connection failure is often caused by improper assembly installation, improper torque, or damaged seals, excessive pressure, excessive temperature. The best indicators of hose or tube failure include leaking oil from line or connection, dirt accumulating around connections, or frayed hose. For leaking connections, you have three potential repair options. Retorque, replace seals, or replace the connector. With tube failure, you'll need to replace tube assembly. When hose failure occurs, you have two possible repairs. Replace hose assembly, rebuild with bulk hose and reusable coupling. You must choose replacement hoses carefully. Always replace hoses with the same size and type as the original. A replacement hose that is too small will restrict flow, causing overheating and pressure loss. A replacement hose that does not have a sufficient pressure rating is a serious safety hazard. Working on any hydraulic component usually means opening hydraulic lines. Always be aware of dangerous high pressure and temperature conditions whenever disconnecting or opening a line. For more details on the safest procedure for preparing to work on a Caterpillar hydraulic system, review the lesson on safety in Chapter 1.
Upon completing this topic, you'll be able to identify hydraulic valves, discuss their location, design, function, and application, and apply basic troubleshooting strategies. Objective. You'll be able to describe the function of valves in the hydraulic system, name several types of valves, and describe their operation. All hydraulic systems use valves to activate cylinders and motors and to control other fluid flow and pressure requirements of the system. These valves may be individual components, grouped within a single housing, or stacked together in valve banks. The simplest type of valve is the common gate valve. Flow is controlled by moving the valve stem against or away from the valve seat. This simple valve can also affect pressure in a circuit. As the opening between the valve seat and stem becomes smaller, flow is restricted, causing pressure to drop on the downstream side of the valve. This phenomenon is called the orifice effect. The amount of pressure drop across an orifice depends on both the flow rate and the size of the orifice. If flow remains constant, the smaller the orifice, the greater the pressure differential. If flow rate drops, the pressure differential also drops. If flow is blocked downstream, pressure becomes equalized on both sides of the orifice. However, if flow remains constant, the differential remains constant, causing upstream pressure to rise if downstream pressure rises. Many of the valves in complex hydraulic systems take advantage of these principles. Hydraulic valves can generally be grouped into three categories. Directional control valves control the path fluid takes through the system. Examples include selector valves, which control the operation of actuators, check valves, and makeup valves. Flow control valves are special valves that control the rate of flow through a circuit. Pressure control valves can limit maximum pressure within a circuit or maintain a desired pressure difference between two circuits. Examples include various types of relief valves, pressure reducing valves, and pressure differential valves. Objective. You'll be able to describe how a directional control valve works and its primary function in Caterpillar hydraulic systems. Directional control valves provide the primary means of controlling the operation of actuators and other components by directing the flow of oil to a desired circuit. There are three types of directional control valves, the selector valve, the check valve, and the makeup valve. Selector valves control the operation of actuators and other components in a hydraulic system by allowing the valve to determine the direction and rate of oil flow. Most selector valves have a spool that slides back and forth in the valve bore. The spool has large diameters called lands, which can block or open valve ports. Some spools also include throttling slots. These slots allow the gradual flow of oil to the component, eliminating the jarring on and off operation of the valve and permitting easier and more precise control of the component. Some spools have lubrication grooves around the heavy lands on either end of the spool to trap oil. This causes the spool to float on a film of oil, keeping it centered and easier to move. The spool is usually centered in the valve with springs and can be moved manually or electrically with solenoids. Large spools that are difficult to operate manually or are in distant locations may be hydraulically actuated. Selector valves that control the operation of other valves are called pilot valves. Selector valves typically consist of three or more positions. Each position changes fluid flow to the actuator. In a three-position open center valve, the middle or neutral position holds the actuator in place. Ports A and B are blocked and supply oil is returned to the tank. With the valve position to extend the actuator, oil is sent through port B to the actuator. With the valve position to retract the actuator, oil is sent through port A to the actuator. A closed center valve is similar to an open center valve, except that pump flow is blocked in the centered or neutral position.
This is an orthographic drawing of an open-centered directional control valve. Also included in the valve body are two line relief valves, number one on the drawing, and a check valve, number two on the drawing. The valve is shown here in the hold position, where ports A and B are blocked and supply oil is returned to the tank. When the valve is shifted to this position, supply oil is sent through port B to the cylinder where it extends the rod. Return oil travels back through port A and returns to the tank. Number three shows the return line and number four the supply line. A check valve can be classified as either a directional or flow control valve. Its primary function is to allow flow in only one direction. The most common design is a piston or ball and a spring. The check valve is often used in combination with other valves. Pressure on the upstream side of the valve is sufficient to overcome the force of the spring, pushing the piston away from the seat and allowing flow through the valve. Flow in the opposite direction lets pressure work with the spring, closing the valve and blocking flow. This is an orthographic drawing of a check valve from a G-series motor grader. It consists of two check valves and a piston. When the directional control valve is shifted, supply oil flows through port A. Pressure overcomes the force of the spring, pushing the ball away from the seat and opening a passageway for flow through the valve. At the same time, the pressure causes the piston to move to the right, unseating the other check valve and allowing return oil to flow back through port B. If pressure on the downstream side of the valve exceeds supply pressure, the valve closes, preventing flow in the opposite direction. Check valves may be individual components, as they are on this motor grater, where they help prevent implement drift. Or they may be incorporated into a common housing with other valves, as in this 910 valve body. A makeup valve is a type of check valve that allows return oil to flow directly to actuator lines whenever return pressure is greater than inlet pressure to the actuator. This prevents cylinders from voiding when dropping blades or buckets drain the cylinders faster than the pump can supply oil. The makeup valve consists of a check valve and a light spring. When oil pressure drops to approximately 2 pounds per square inch less than the return line pressure, the valve unseats, allowing oil to flow to line. This is an orthographic drawing of a makeup valve which shares the same valve body with a directional control valve on a backhoe loader. With the directional control valve in the retract position, Supply pressure works with the makeup valve spring to keep the valve seated. If pressure to the cylinder should drop because of a falling bucket, the makeup valve opens and allows return oil to flow to the cylinder. This is an example of a makeup valve on a D4H track type tractor. The quick drop valve is a more complex makeup valve used on some medium and large track type tractors. It consists of a two-piece check valve and spring and an orifice. The valve is located between the cylinder and the implement control valve and is normally closed. Take a moment to study this valve. Note the locations of its components. The number one indicates the location of the two-piece check valve. Number two, the spring. Number three, the orifice. Number four shows the rod end and number five, the head end. When the blade is lowered without resistance, its weight causes it to drop faster than the pump can fill the head end of the cylinder. This results in a lower supply pressure. Return oil from the rod end of the cylinder is restricted by the orifice, which causes the pressure to increase. This pressure acts on the end of the check valve, moving it to the right. Rod end oil can now enter the head end supply passage to add to the oil coming from the pump. This allows the blade to drop very fast without cavitating the cylinder. Objective. You'll be able to describe how a flow control valve works and its primary function in Caterpillar hydraulic systems. Flow control valves are often used to regulate the speed of the actuator or to divide flow between two or more circuits. A flow control valve can be a simple gate valve with a preset opening or various dynamic spring-loaded valve arrangements.
The flow control valve provides a predetermined maximum flow rate to one circuit and bypasses excess flow to another circuit or back to tank. It consists of an orifice, a dump valve, and a light spring. These valves can control flow to a fine degree. The orifice is designed to pass a certain flow at a specified pressure differential. As oil flows through the orifice, a pressure differential is created. Higher pressure pushes against the upstream side of the dump valve. However, the lower pressure plus the spring force act against the downstream side of the dump valve, keeping it closed. When the flow rate increases through the orifice, the differential between the two pressures also rises. The downstream pressure and spring force are no longer greater than upstream pressure, so the valve opens, bypassing excess flow. The flow through the orifice will then be maintained at the required value. If the downstream flow is blocked, equal pressure on both sides of the orifice keeps the dump valve closed. A more common type of flow control valve combines the action of the orifice and dump valve in one moving part. This is an orthographic drawing of a flow control valve on a small wheel loader. A relief valve shares the same valve body. Study the drawing and take note of the following components. Number one on the graphic shows the relief valve. Number two, the orifice. Number three, the dump valve. Number four, circuit B. And number five, the location of circuit A. The line in the upper left is the supply line. The orifice and dump valve are combined in one moving part. At startup, supply oil flows through the orifice where downstream pressure works with the spring to keep the valve closed. As flow rate increases, the differential between upstream and downstream pressure rises, allowing the higher upstream pressure to open the dump valve. Excess flow is bypassed into circuit B, maintaining the desired flow in circuit A. Another variation of the flow control valve incorporates a spool valve, which senses pressure on both sides of the orifice. The pressure drop across the orifice is controlled by the spring. By controlling the maximum pressure drop across the orifice, we control the maximum flow through it. In this illustration, the spool valve is identified by the number 1, the orifice with the number 2, and the spring with the number 3. The orifice can either be fixed or variable, and quite often is a directional control spool. Another type of flow control valve is the flow divider valve. This valve equally divides oil flow between two circuits, regardless of loads or restrictions. In this orthographic drawing, you can see that number one shows the location of the flow divider valve. Number two points out the relief valves. Number three, circuit A. Number four, the inlet. And number five, circuit B. When the load on both circuits is the same, the spool is centered. If circuit A has a greater load than circuit B, the spool shifts to the right, restricting flow to circuit B. This maintains equal flow to both circuits. This flow control valve from an IT-12B prioritizes flow to the steering circuit. Excess flow is bypassed to other circuits. Objective. You'll be able to describe how a pressure relief valve works and its primary function in Caterpillar hydraulic systems. Pressure relief valves are used to limit maximum system or circuit pressure and protect components from excessive pressure. If pressure exceeds a predetermined level, the relief valve opens, venting oil to the tank. A simple relief valve consists of a valve body, piston, and spring. The piston is normally held closed on the seat by a predetermined spring force. If system pressure is greater than the spring force, the valve will open, allowing oil to pass to the tank. Simple relief valves don't provide precise control of pressure, and in certain applications, the valve chatters. In this design, since the piston has a smaller effective area, a weaker spring is used, allowing the valve to open and close with smaller fluctuations in system pressure. This eliminates chatter and provides more precise control of pressure. This is an orthographic drawing of the main relief valve on a differential steer track type tractor. The piston is normally held closed by the force of the spring. Study this drawing, paying particular attention to the location of various components. Number one on the graphic indicates the location of the spring. Number two, the piston. Three, the supply line. Four, the return line. And five, the adjustment screw. 
If system pressure exceeds the force of the spring, the piston unseats, allowing oil to bypass to the tank. The adjustment screw controls the force of the spring, which determines maximum system pressure. This is a simple relief valve from a 966 wheel loader. Other types of relief valves can be found on Caterpillar machines depending on system requirements. These are three of the most common types. Pilot operated relief valve, piston operated relief valve, modulating relief valve. Pilot operated relief valves are used in many high pressure systems where it's important to maintain uniform pressure under different flow rates. The valve consists of a small pilot valve that is used to control the larger unloading valve. The pilot operated relief valve consists of a pilot valve spring that controls the maximum system or circuit pressure and an unloading valve with an orifice that's held shut during normal operation by a large weak spring. With system pressure less than the pilot valve set point, the pilot valve remains closed. The unloading valve spring chamber is filled and since there is no flow, oil pressure on both sides of the unloading valve orifice are the same. Therefore, the unloading valve spring holds the unloading valve closed. When oil pressure rises to the relief valve setting, the pilot valve opens and dumps oil from the unloading valve spring chamber to the return line. Since more oil can flow past the pilot valve than through the unloading valve orifice, the pressure drops in the unloading valve spring chamber. The higher system or circuit pressure pushes the unloading valve open, allowing pump flow to be dumped into the return line. This gives precise pressure control in high pressure systems using a small spring and small mechanical construction. This is an orthographic drawing of a pilot operated relief valve from a medium sized track type tractor. As you examine this drawing, note the location of important components. Number one identifies the pilot operated relief valve, number two the pilot valve, number three the spring, number four the unloading valve, and number five the orifice. If circuit pressure is less than the pilot valve set point, the pilot valve remains closed. And since oil pressures on both sides of the unloading valve are the same, the spring holds the unloading valve closed. When circuit pressure rises to the relief valve setting, the pilot valve opens and dumps oil from the unloading valve spring chamber to the return line. This causes pressure to drop in the unloading valve spring chamber, allowing the higher circuit pressure to open the unloading valve. Pump flow is dumped back to the tank and circuit pressure is reduced. Main relief on a 916 wheel loader is a pilot operated relief valve. A piston operated relief valve provides precise control in a wide range of system and circuit pressures. The piston operated valve consists of a valve body, piston, valve and spring. In a normal operating condition, circuit pressure against the piston is insufficient to overcome the force of the spring. When circuit pressure acting against the piston exceeds spring force, the valve opens, allowing oil to dump into the return line. Because the oil acting against the piston enters through a small passage, pressure buildup is gradual, modulating piston movement. A series of small damper holes in the valve spool helps prevent valve chatter. This is an orthographic drawing of a piston operated relief valve. It consists of a piston, valve and spring. In normal operating conditions, the spring holds the valve closed. When circuit pressure acting against the piston exceeds spring force, the valve opens, allowing oil to dump to the return line. The small passage to the piston causes pressure buildup to occur gradually, modulating piston movement. The small damper holes in the valve spool help prevent valve chatter. This is an example of a piston operated relief valve. A modulating relief valve is used to allow a gradual buildup of pressure. It's sometimes found in transmissions to facilitate smooth shifting. A modulating relief valve usually consists of the parts pointed out on this illustration. Number one is the slug, two, the spring, three, the modulating relief valve, four, the orifice and check valve arrangement, five, the load piston cavity, and six, the torque converter circuit. At machine startup, the springs between the load piston and modulating relief valve are at full extension. The pump supplies oil to the slug chamber, moving the modulating relief valve to the right. 
This allows some oil to enter the converter circuit. Oil is also sent through the orifice check valve to the chamber on the right side of the load chamber. As oil fills the chamber, pressure builds, moving the load piston to the left and closing off the modulating relief valve to the converter circuit. Pressure builds in the modulating relief valve slug cavity again, moving it to the right. The movement of the modulating relief valve and the load piston against each other compresses the spring more and more until the load piston reaches its maximum travel. A passage opens, venting oil in the load piston chamber to tank. At this time, maximum pressure has been reached. The orifice controls the rate of flow to the load piston. By controlling the rate of flow to the load piston, we control how fast the pressure rises in the system. The check valve allows for a rapid dump of the load piston chamber when the supply oil pressure drops, such as between shifts. This allows the modulation cycle to start again when the springs are fully extended. This is a modulating relief valve from a power shift transmission. It controls maximum clutch pressure. Objective. You'll be able to describe how a pressure reducing valve works and its primary function in Caterpillar hydraulic systems. Pressure reducing valves are used when circuit pressure requirements are less than supply pressure. The pressure reducing valve consists of a piston, spring, and spool. The force of the spring determines maximum downstream pressure. The valve is normally open. As flow passes the spool, downstream pressure builds. As the pressure in the piston cavity builds, it acts against the piston and spool, overcomes the force of the spring, and begins closing off the opening. When downstream pressure matches the resistance of the spring, movement stops, maintaining the reduced downstream pressure. This is an orthographic drawing of a pressure reducing valve. It consists of a piston, a spring, and a spool. The valve is normally open. As flow passes the spool, downstream pressure builds. As pressure builds in the piston cavity, it acts against the piston and spool, overcoming the force of the spring and closing off the opening. When downstream pressure matches the resistance of the spring, movement of the spool stops, maintaining the desired downstream pressure. This is a disassembled pressure reducing valve. Objective. You'll be able to describe how a pressure differential valve works and its primary function in Caterpillar hydraulic systems. A pressure differential valve provides a means of sequencing the supply of oil to two circuits or maintaining a constant pressure differential between two circuits. The pressure differential valve consists of a spring and a spool. On this drawing, the spring is identified by the number 1 and the spool by the number 2. Also note that the number 3 corresponds to the location of the primary circuit. The secondary circuit is number 4. The spool initially blocks flow from the primary to the secondary circuit. Once flow requirements to the primary circuit are met, pressure rises, moving the spool against the spring and allowing flow into the secondary circuit and the spring chamber. As secondary pressure builds, the valve moves back to the right. The valve will constantly adjust its position so that the pressure in the secondary circuit equals the pressure in the primary circuit, less the force of the spring. This is an orthographic drawing of a pressure differential valve. It consists of a spring and a spool. Study the drawing carefully. The number 1 indicates the location of the spring, and number 2, the location of the spool. Number 3 points out the primary circuit, and number 4, the secondary circuit. The spool initially blocks flow to the secondary circuit. Once flow requirements to primary circuits are met, pressure rises, moving the spool against the spring and allowing flow into the secondary circuit and spring chamber. As secondary pressure builds, the valve moves back to the right. It will constantly adjust its position so that pressure in the secondary circuit equals the pressure in the primary circuit, less the force of the spring. This is a pressure differential valve from a power shift transmission. It allows the speed clutch to fill before the directional clutch. You'll know basic service requirements, 
be able to recognize valve failure indicators and their causes, and be able to apply basic troubleshooting strategies. Properly functioning valves are critical to the performance of any hydraulic system. This lesson discusses how and why valves fail, what can be done to prevent failure, and options for repair. Valve failure can take several forms, including internal and external leakage, breakage, normal wear and fatigue, or sticking. The most common causes of valve failure are contamination, causing valves to stick, plugging orifices, and creating abrasive wear between mating parts of valves. Heat, causing valves to stick from varnish buildup and fatigue failures in springs. Normal wear, improper assembly, adjustment, or seal failure. If you notice any of the following, valve failure may be the cause. Erratic implement control, poor machine performance, visible leaks. When valve failure occurs, you have basically four options for repair. One, disassemble and clean. Two, replace parts, spools, springs, seals, or valve body. Three, adjust the valve. Or four, replace complete valve assembly. Upon completing this topic, you'll be able to identify hydraulic cylinders, discuss their location, design, function, and application, and apply basic troubleshooting strategies. Objective. Given a basic diagram, you'll be able to identify cylinder components and state their functions. In this lesson, you'll learn about the component parts of hydraulic cylinders. The main purpose of hydraulic systems on Caterpillar machines is to power implements such as blades and buckets. This is usually accomplished with cylinders, which are linear actuators that convert hydraulic energy to mechanical energy. This is a common double-acting cylinder found on many Caterpillar products. A. Rod. B. Cylinder tube. C. Cap eye. D. Rod eye. E. Cylinder head. F. Connection points. G. Piston. H. Piston nut. The rod is connected to the piston and must carry the load on the implement. It's usually made of highly polished, hard chrome-plated, high tensile steel that resists pitting and scoring. The cylinder tube is a barrel made of cast or extruded steel or tubing with a welded cap on one end. The interior of the barrel is finished very true and smooth. The cap eye allows the cap end of the cylinder to be attached to the machine or implement. The rod eye allows the rod end of the cylinder to be attached to the machine or implement. The cylinder head encloses the open end of the cylinder and allows an opening for the rod to pass in and out of the cylinder. It can be screwed onto the cylinder or attached by tie bolts or bolted flanges. The cylinder head sometimes includes a port. The threaded crown screws onto the outside of the cylinder tube. The threaded gland cylinder head screws into the inside of the cylinder tube. The piston is a steel disc attached to the end of the rod. Hydraulic pressure on either side of the piston forces movement of the rod. The piston nut attaches the rod to the piston. These cylinder components are connection points for lines, providing passage for supply and return oil. There are a number of seals in a hydraulic cylinder. The seals on this cylinder are identified as follows. One is the rod wiper. Two, the rod buffer. Three, the piston seal. Four, the piston wear ring. Five, the rod seal. Six, the rod wear ring. And seven is the head seal. The rod wiper seal keeps dirt from entering the cylinder. The rod buffer is a secondary rod seal, preventing pressure spikes from reaching the rod seal. The piston seal provides a seal between the piston and the cylinder tube. This reduces leakage between the rod and head end of the piston. The piston wear ring centers the piston in the cylinder tube and prevents scoring of the tube by the piston. The rod seal functions as the primary rod seal, sealing oil inside the cylinder to prevent leaks. 
The rod wear ring is a sleeve that centers the rod in the head and prevents scoring of the rod by the head. The head seal prevents leakage between the head and the cylinder tube. There are three terms frequently used to describe cylinder seals. Dynamic seals are used between surfaces in which there is movement of the sealed surfaces in relation to each other. Static seals are used between surfaces where there is no movement. Oversize seals are used in cylinders that are honed oversize and require oversize, 30 thousandths or 60 thousandths of an inch, head seals, piston seals, and piston wear bands. An additional feature of some hydraulic cylinders are snubbers. These devices reduce piston speed as the rod nears the end of its stroke, cushioning the impact. The boom cylinder on a 446 backhoe loader has an integral head-end snubber. The snubber cushions the boom as it reaches full retraction by creating an orifice in the passage that slows the piston. In this illustration, the snubber is identified as 1, the piston as 2, the rod as 3, and the cylinder as 4. As the rod on this 215 excavator boom, bucket, or stick cylinder retracts, the snubber enters the small bore at the end of the cylinder. This causes the area of the outlet passage to become smaller, restricting oil flow and reducing the rate of rod travel. The snubber on the other side of the piston works in a similar way as the rod extends. 1. Snubber 2. Piston 3. Rod 4. Cylinder Another type of component that protects cylinders is the piston bypass valve. These valves are spools located in the piston. During extension and retraction, Oil pressure keeps the valve seated. This is shown in illustration number one. As the piston nears the end of its stroke in either direction, the valves are unseated, allowing pressure oil to vent to the tank. Illustration number two depicts the valves in the bypass position. These valves are found on medium and large track type tractors. They prevent structural damage, especially when the blade has been tilted and the operator goes to full raise. Objective you'll be able to identify various types of hydraulic cylinders used in Caterpillar equipment. This lesson discusses the various types of hydraulic cylinders used on Caterpillar machines. A single acting cylinder is hydraulically powered in only one direction. Oil entering a single port forces the actuator to extend. The weight of the load retracts the actuator. The three-point hitch on this Challenger 65 uses two single-acting cylinders. A double-acting cylinder is hydraulically driven in two directions. Pressure oil enters at the cap end of the cylinder to extend it. Oil is forced from the rod end and returned to tank. To retract the cylinder, high pressure oil is directed to the rod end. This is a double acting cylinder on an 815B compactor. A single acting telescoping cylinder has an inner and outer rod. The outer rod extends first until fully extended. Then the inner rod extends. Gravity forces both sections to retract. This lift truck is equipped with a single acting telescoping cylinder so that the load can be raised higher than with a non-telescoping cylinder. The double acting telescoping cylinder has an inner and outer rod. The outer rod extends first until fully extended, then the inner rod extends. Oil first retracts the inner rod, then the outer rod. Some cylinders use gravity to retract the outer rod. This off-highway truck uses a double-acting telescoping cylinder to raise and lower the body. A double-rodded cylinder has a piston with a rod on both ends. This gives equal effective working area on both sides of the piston and balances the working forces of the cylinder whether it's extending or retracting. This 416 has a double-rodded cylinder in the steering circuit, allowing for balanced working force when steering. You'll know basic service requirements, be able to recognize cylinder failure indicators and their causes, 
and be able to apply basic troubleshooting strategies. Of all the components in a mobile hydraulic system, cylinders work the hardest. They bear the full load of implements and are subjected to the rough environment that is home to many Caterpillar machines. This lesson covers the maintenance and repair of cylinders. If cylinder failure has occurred, it usually results in one of the following. Interior and exterior leakage, breakage, or physical damage. Cylinders may fail for many reasons. Among the most common causes are contaminants causing scoring and pitting, excessive pressure, abuse, improper assembly, or wear. If you notice any of these conditions, it may indicate cylinder failure, leaking oil, drift in excess of specifications, this only applies when the rod is out, cracked component parts, or rod pitting and scoring. A variety of repair options are available for cylinders depending on the type of cylinder and whether there are problems with the rod or cylinder. Refer to appropriate product support literature for details.